Great Ape Survival Partnership GRASP webcast, The Experts Speak. My name is Doug Kress, and I'm the Program Coordinator of the Great Ape Survival Partnership. I'm coming to you from our headquarters here in, uh, in Nairobi, Kenya, in East Africa, at the United Nations Environment Program. Uh, thank you for joining us this afternoon. If you are a regular viewer, you know these programs follow a format of, of key issues and uh, key agendas that uh, threaten great apes and their habitat. And today we'll be discussing the ongoing situation of 63 chimpanzees that were formerly used in biomedical research that have been essentially left to their own devices and abandoned on islands outside of the Liberian capital of Monrovia. Now, to get to our topic today, it was really one year ago this week that the New York Blood Center uh, formally ceased its support of chimpanzees that had been placed or outsourced, I guess you'd say, on six mangrove islands in the rivers outside of Monrovia. The official letter, which came on March 6th, I believe, in 20, 2015, made it very clear that the New York Blood Center, which for over 30 years have been doing a biomedical testing on chimpanzees in Monrovia in order to uh, test various vaccines for hepatitis and other infectious diseases. Uh, it was clear we had borne no more responsibility for these chimpanzees. While ceasing the operations and ceasing support did not come as a surprise, it had been rumored and certainly discussed for many years, the finality of New York Blood Centers Act certainly outraged and uh, horrified a number of human beings, I should say, and organizations that care about the welfare of wildlife. The New York Blood Center was invited to join us on this webcast today or to give us a statement, and they chose to do neither. We do, however, want to just read the statement that is currently posted on the New York Blood Center website, which says, New York Blood Center no longer engages in non-human primate research and is not positioned to debate issues of animal rights, animal use and research, or other matters that, while very important, are beyond our mission and scope. We have declined opportunities to comment further because we are currently involved in legal proceedings with Liberia on related issues. So joining us today to discuss the issue of biomedical research and the fate of these chimpanzees in Liberia, uh, first in Monrovia currently are Jimmy Desmond and Jenny Desmond who work for the Liberia Chimpanzee Rescue Project which is supported by the Humane Society of the United States. Uh, Jim and Jenny, welcome to the program. Thank you. We also have Kathleen Conley. She's the Vice President of Animal Research Issues for the Humane Society of the United States. Welcome, Kathleen. Thank you. And we have Peter Fundy. He's a research scientist in conservation biology for the Institute of Primate Research, the IPR, which is based here in southern Nairobi, Kenya. Welcome, Peter. Well, thank you. Great. Well, let me start right away with the situation as it is today. It is one year since the chimpanzees were officially uh, cut off from the funding that had been provided and support provided by the New York Blood Center. Uh, but to you, Jim and Jenny Desmond there in Monrovia, what is the current situation? There are 63 chimpanzees living on these islands, and you see them fairly regularly. Now, what is the status? Well, we're really happy to report that in the midst of all of the negative events and all the negative uh, stories that you've heard about New York Blood Center and what the chimpanzees have been through, that we've seen some remarkable, beautiful, wonderful changes in the chimpanzees thanks to Humane Society and all the supporters and the coalition members who stepped in and provided not only emergency help, but now it's been a year. And so these chimpanzees, since last July when we first came, have started receiving daily feedings, which has made a significant difference in not only their physical well-being, but their emotional well-being. Uh, we were able to hire on a formal team, which is a fantastic team that we have working there to care for the chimps. Um, we've been able to monitor their health and, and do some vet veterinary intervention, uh, provide a diverse and, and nutritious diet for them, and we've noticed really significant changes. Um, the, their coats are glossy, they're gaining weight. Uh, the chimpanzees we met the first day who ran to the boat in desperation, screaming with fearful faces, asking for food, are now reading 
excited, of course, as chimps are when they get food, but uh, excited as a normal chimp would be to get their food. And, and on the shoreline, um, think, getting excited about the food coming and also um, relaxing and choosing which foods to eat, and their whole demeanor has changed. So it's we've really seen some amazing and remarkable changes here uh, since, since the intervention. Thanks. That's very encouraging. And I think just so anybody viewing this or listening in that doesn't understand the situation, the chimpanzees are on islands that you cannot freely walk onto as um, a tourist or as a, even a, a veterinary care expert or a welfare expert. They are, they are marooned, essentially, and, and can only be reached by boats that come out of Monrovia, correct? Yes. So the food is, is uh, procured all around Liberia. There's not a large agricultural uh, system going here. So a lot of the food has to be prepared during the, during the week and then loaded, cut up, prepared, washed, and loaded onto boats. So every day our team goes out on a boat to each of the six islands and delivers the food um, by boat and then uh, comes back and does it all over again <laughs> the next day. So it's, it's not a simple task. It's pretty labor intensive. Um, but I think the, the chimps now realize the food is coming every day. Even when New York Blood Center was providing food, it was only coming every other day. Um, if that, we, we don't exactly know how often the chimps are being fed. Um, and again, the, the, the islands have no natural food or water sources, so we also have water systems, which we've been able to repair and renovate. And the chimps can now drink at will. They have taps they can drink from, which is a, another vastly big difference in their lives. I was going to ask about the water, but you've answered that question already. But what about veterinary care? If a chimpanzee has an injury or perhaps uh, you're trying to institute some kind of a birth control program, how does one or can one safely access the chimpanzees on the island? Surely you're outnumbered. Yes. Yeah, I currently, and when, when New York Blood Center uh, retired the chimpanzees out to the islands, um, they really didn't set it up properly. Uh, what they should have done was to put infrastructure on the islands, like a holding facility of some kind, like they have at most sanctuaries, where you could get access to the chimpanzees on a daily basis. So you could isolate one if they were sick, or you know just monitor them, see them every day, get a better idea of what was going on. That's certainly not the case now. If one is, usually what happens is we just we, we monitor them, see them every day. Um, and check to see if everyone's there. That's the first thing. It's like we see every chimp. Sometimes they're not there, um, but they might show up a day or two later. But we really can't go on the island and search for them. So that's one of the goals moving forward would be to build some infrastructure on an uninhabited island and get the chimps there and slowly start making it more like a, a real study. Um, but we were able to implement the birth control program. program um, that was another thing. Some of the chimpanzees um, had vasectomies or uh, or had uh, tubal ligations, uh, but some can, can still reproduce. Uh, so we we given them um, birth control pills in like a little um, homemade sort of candy made out of curated and milk powder. And so <laughs> some guys get a placebo; if they don't need it. But you know, all, almost all the females that are of age that, that could reproduce are receiving. So, um, and that's been successful as far as we can tell. Like we'll know for sure in, in a few more months if possible. And then we'll uh, then we'll try and start putting them in. It's hard to imagine uh, chimpanzees that have gone through these testing programs. The, the New York Blood Center began its Vilab program back in 1974, and even though it ceased testing uh, 10 years ago, they certainly were never kept in conditions that I think most animal welfare experts or primate experts would regard as being um, the best. Yet it seems as though there's there's a, an ability to overcome that past. Uh, they seem to be approachable to those of you who are experts there on the ground, correct? I, I, I never cease to amaze me how resilient chimpanzees are. Uh, I agree with you. I, I don't know why they trust any of us. Um, in fact, some of our team members are people who have worked with them for 30 years. and. Our team members have made it clear to us that when they first put them on the islands and they would deliver food, the chimps would hide from them. So it took them several months to change their attitudes. But again, resiliency and 
the remarkable ability to, to learn to trust again. Uh, and, and they've accepted us very willingly, um, greet us when we come. And yeah, I, I find it amazing also that, that, they, that they do, in fact, understand that we're trying to do good. But I, I think they have an innate understanding of uh, the fact that we're coming there to do something to help them. That's very encouraging. I can turn now to Kathleen. Um, it was about a, a year ago, next this week, that the New York Blood Center formally ceased its support of the uh, the Violab chimpanzees. Take us through, if you could, your uh, reaction to that event and what kicked you into overdrive, which is what basically happened, in trying to raise funds and awareness in support of this um, this event. Uh, the Humane Society of the United States has been at the forefront ever since that that moment in, in March of 2015. So if you could just give us some backstory to this, please, Kathleen. Sure. So this uh, issue came to our attention uh, very quickly after New York Blood Center abandoned the chimps. And obviously, I was outraged. Our organization was outraged. There were a number of individuals who really stepped up to the plate, including the caregivers who were still going out and feeding the chimpanzees despite the fact that they really didn't have the resources to do so, so on their own time. And it just, nobody else on the scene really had the ability as an organization, for example, to respond. So we felt it was important to step in and start at least providing emergency funding. And um, that's what we did, and we quickly became very involved in, in the outcome for these animals. Obviously, we couldn't have done it without and cannot continue to do it without the support of so many members of the public and experts who have guided us along the way. I personally worked at a primate breeding facility in the United States and we actually had an island where there were monkeys living on the island and getting provisioned every day so I had familiarity with running an island, uh, island facility, not a sanctuary, and also worked with chimpanzees in a sanctuary so all my worlds kind of collided and I didn't sleep for a few months there, worried about how we were going to take care of this. I, st I still don't sleep, but now that Jim and Jenny are there, a little bit more. I'm so thankful to everybody who stepped forward. We have 37 coalition members. It's been a group effort, no doubt, and the public has been overwhelmingly supportive. And I hope they'll continue to stay engaged, you know, for these animals. You, you turned to the public fairly quickly in, in a public way, which was would make sense. As I understand it, the original bill each month was about 30,000 U.S. dollars to feed the chimpanzees and, and pay the staff costs and so forth. Uh, two questions. Is that still the running cost, and how has the money been coming in? So um, the, we've gotten it down to about $20,000 a month. Uh, we probably will see that increase. We, we ultimately, Jim and Jenny, are going to be working to get the chimpanzees fed twice a day, which will increase costs. But we've still been able to save some money. And um, actually, we didn't respond that quickly in a public way um, because it happened in March. We were sending emergency funding. Uh, the chimps didn't have fresh water. So there was a lot to put in place. And we did not really go public until the end of May. And since then, we've had a crowdfunding site that's raised about $260,000. So that's a little, that's more than a year's worth of care. You know, the trouble is the crowdfunding site doesn't show you when the funds go out. It just shows you the total you've raised. So it may appear we have plenty of funds to rely on, but um, we have to keep, um, you know, every month spending that $20,000. And obviously the infrastructure costs are going to be another big endeavor. If we want to build shelters on the islands, then uh, that's going to cost some money as well. So, but I think, you know, I, I have been astounded at the public's um, response to this. I think no matter how you feel about biomedical research on animals, this is an outrageous case. And thankfully, everybody has stepped up. The New York Blood Center is currently involved in some form of litigation with the government of Liberia over this case, which is one of the reasons that uh, New York Blood Center does not want to speak further on this, this matter. Um, regardless, though, what is the long-term perspective? Once you've now got stability on the islands and you have staff and, and expertise there in Monrovia at, at hand, how long can this go on in this form? And 
what is the, what is the, uh, the ultimate objective? Well, you know, in the short term, well, continuing on, we're going to continue to pressure near flood center. They have to take on some kind of financial responsibility here. And one of the reasons we didn't go public right away is we were giving them an opportunity to sit down with us and talk about what that uh, long-term outcome looks like. We never received a response to multiple communications. They just refused to engage in any discussion, and that continues today. So we're going to continue to keep the pressure on. Uh, we've had you know, celebrities speak out. We've had Jane Goodall support us. Um, we've had tons of media attention, and they still refuse to engage. I think they think it's going to go away, but that is not the case. We're going to continue to pressure them. But aside from that, um, you know, our plan is to get this to be a facility that's a long-term um, proper sanctuary. So meeting Pan-African Sanctuary Alliance standards is the long-term goal. And uh, we want to do right by these animals, and we hope Near Flood Center will continue, I uh, will decide to come forward and help with that. If they don't, we're going to hopefully continue to move forward with public support and um, get these animals the long-term you know, care they deserve. And I think it sends a strong message that you can't just use these animals and dump them and, and get away with it, number one. And number two, I think we have a great opportunity. It seems very clear, and Jim and Jenny might want to speak more to this, that there is a need for a sanctuary on the ground in Liberia. So we can make a right out of a very... <laughs> terrible wrong. I think there's no question the illegal trade issues and orphan chimpanzee issues uh, throughout Liberia are, are severe to say the least and it's always been a country that was problematic. It was always ironic though that uh, the Violat facility itself in just outside of Monrovia for many years was state-of-the-art. It had incredible handling facilities and so forth. It was just attached to a very terrible biomedical researching uh, protocol. Um, I could turn, if I could, on that note, <laughs> yeah, to Peter Fundy, who works for the uh, Institute of Primate Research here in Kenya. I want to make it clear that Peter's not affiliated with Biolab or the New York Blood Center in any way, and the uh, Institute of Primate Research does not test on great apes here in Kenya. But you do test, uh, do clinical tests uh, for infectious diseases, HIV, SIV, and so forth, on vervet monkeys and baboons. And I want just to get a sense from you, Peter, what is the the, the mindset in, in primate testing, and what is your take on the situation that is currently still developing in Liberia? Well, my, my, my take on this is that uh, once an organization has taken individuals from the wild, in the wild caught primates, you have an obligation to actually take care of these animals. What happens at IPR is that uh, we take animals from the wild, uh, but uh, uh, of late what we've been doing is um, actually uh, trying to breed these animals in, the, in, the, in captivity because it will be so much unethical to take animals in the wild. These are animals that have been free for a very long time and then you come and uh, use them uh, in the lab uh, and then you dump them out there. So I, I would think and I believe that we should have a, a system where we are breeding animals for biomedical uh, use. At IPL we do uh, preclinical pre testing. Uh, we, we use uh, both baboons and vervets. However, after they are, they, they, they are used for whichever test they used, we actually do uh, trials to see whether they are clean of any diseases. Uh, they are kept in captivity and they can be used again for any other, any other project which is coming up. Is it still necessary though to have uh, primate testing centers in this day and age when there's computer models and so many of the testing programs, let's say in the United States or in Europe, are phasing out or being closed altogether because they never produced the results that were uh, thought to be right at hand? Uh, well, we should, uh, we should start getting away from this whole idea of using primates uh, uh, for biomedical research. Um, I am strong in conservation and I don't, I've never believed in the use of uh, primates for biomedical testing or uh, having primates in captivity in any way. Uh, we should actually uh, start moving from this use of uh, primates for biomedical research because uh, in one way or the other you cannot be able to release these animals back to the wild. You cannot have them interact with uh, other wild animals out there when, once you use them uh, for any biomedical 
kind of a study. Again, they have lost most of the, the wild uh, in its behaviors, like looking for food. So uh, we should start focusing on using other methods for biomedical research and not use of primates, actually. And what is your response to this issue of essentially abandoning the apes uh, on the islands in, in Liberia? Just as a gut response in terms of being a professional researcher. Well, uh, from from what I from my take is that uh, once you have used these animals, of, taken these animals from the wild, you have a responsibility as an organization to continue taking care of these animals, uh, leaving them out there. These are creatures you took them, you actually took them from their freedom. You well, you actually decided to imprison them in cages to continue using. So once your your project is over, you have an obligation to continue taking care of these animals. You don't say that the government doesn't support the use of uh, primates anymore in biomedical research, and then you abandon a species out there. Who is going to take care of them? These are animals which cannot look for their own food. They cannot forage. They need human beings to take care of them, and that the organization has to continue actually taking care of these Okay. Well, it, it's worth going back then to think about the island situation they have. Uh, Jim and Jenny Desmond, give us a better sense of what these islands are like. How large are the islands? I believe six are being used right now for the, the, or the 66 chimpanzees are on six different islands. They can't cross between islands as I understand it. Are there other wildlife in the islands or on the islands? Is there, is there much there they can provision themselves with? Uh well, one, one issue, which we already discussed, is that we aren't able to access the island, so we don't know a lot about each island. Um, we do know that some of the islands, we have gotten a general idea that the islands vary in size. Some islands are nicer than others, uh, with more you know, forest area. The chimps do use the mangroves to travel around, but it's not really a, a natural environment for them. Um, so some of the islands are preferable to others, and what we hope, uh, we're looking at a development of a newer island um, that's uninhabited by chimps, and, and we believe there are no other primates there, um, and develop an infrastructure there and rotate some of the chimps out so we can ex access the islands and determine which are the best islands and possibly even do some integrations of the different groups um, onto the larger and um, more you know, forested islands. Uh, but there are not, we, we don't know if the chimps are, they may be eating a few things, they may be eating some leaves, um, and during the rainy season we know they can get water from some pools and streams that form. Um, but we generally find that most of the islands do not have enough, not anything close to enough food or water to supply the chimps with what they would need on a normal day-to-day -day basis. So. Um, and it is that, true they can't go from one island to the other even when the water levels drop, correct? They are not, except we do have one very determined uh, chimpanzee who is <laughs> who we are now trying to uh, do a little better canals, but he's 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 a pretty uh, smart guy and very motivated. Um, and he he does cross the water with a stick uh, and he'll go all the way up to his neck to get to the other island, and he's. Uh, He's the father of six of the <laughs> of the babies who've been born on the islands, uh, thanks to failed birth control from New York Blood Center. Uh, but we have now implemented the birth control, as Jimmy mentioned. So we're hoping that um, even if he is able to to cross every once in a while, that that, that won't result in pregnancies. So. And you did mention the resilience of chimpanzees. That's a perfect example right there for sure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mentioned before that the government of Liberia has been in various forms of litigation with the New York Blood Center for well over a decade probably surrounding a number of issues from the Vilab programs including possible profits and, and ownership issues and so forth. Into this very tangled legal web and <laughs> maze of issues, uh, Kathleen, how is the Humane Society of the United States navigating these waters? and? Will there likely be more litigation against the Blood Center coming from the animal welfare or conservation uh, arenas? So a lot of people do ask, you know, why aren't we suing? What, um, what are we going to do about this? Can't they be held accountable? Unfortunately, it appears at this point that because the government of Liberia technically owns the animals that we won't be able to take legal action, of course, 
Um, if anything comes to light that we could challenge New York Blood Center on this legally, we absolutely will. It's very challenging, of course, when there is legal activity happening between the two parties, the government of Liberia and New York Blood Center, to, for, to have a discussion with New York Blood Center. I think that they've chosen to just shut down because of these legal proceedings and otherwise. So it's definitely been a challenge. I look forward to the day when this is not um, an issue that stands in the way. And hopefully someday we'll get a phone call. You know, they've been getting some of their other groups protesting um, the individuals on the board. So, uh, you know, hopefully some of these things will bring um, them to the table to at least have a discussion. That's simply what we're asking for at this point, is sit down and have a meeting with us. And, and the New York Blood Center is simply a charity in the United States which takes government funding at times but mostly raises its funds and is most uh, active in terms of blood donations. That's correct? Yeah, and you know, obviously we recognize that blood donation organizations play a vital role in human health, and but we don't think that because just because they're a nonprofit involved in that, that means they can simply uh, abandon these animals. They have an ethical obligation to do to take care of them. They have a hundred hundreds of millions in assets, hundreds of millions in um, revenue raising every year. The government of Liberia is one of the poorest countries in the world. How dare they? How dare they expect that somebody else is going to pick up this mess? And how do you keep this, though, from becoming a, a simple human versus animal choice? If you are made to choose as a human being that walks the earth between human health and, and blood, which is central to our health, or chimpanzees that are six or seven or nine thousand miles away from you, how on earth would that not be the choice? And is there, is there a way to not have this become either or? I think I think framing it as a choice is a convenient way to move forward, but it's really not a choice. You know, they they could uh, afford this. They will get support. As a matter of fact, I think human health is being impacted negatively, maybe because their reputation. And we certainly don't want to impact blood donations. We've been asking people to give to other blood blood donating facilities. Um, and not near Flood Center because of what they've done. I just don't see how this has worked out in their favor. And, you know, they had an opportunity and still have an opportunity to come out um, on the right side of this. So there's still an open door if they choose to have a do-over, correct? Absolutely. If they came to the table and were a part of the long-term solution, we would welcome that and we would applaud it. Okay. I'll go back to Peter again for a second. I'm curious, Peter, as an African, does this feel at all as if your continent is being exploited by literally an American organization um, for the benefit of perhaps the world, but certainly it seems the government of Liberia did not receive what it thought was, was fair compensation. How does this play to you uh, emotionally? Well, it, it, it feels uh, so, so bad. It feels wrong when an organization from out there which has been making millions out of uh, these species of natural resources, uh, they, make, they made their money, they made their, their findings, and they just dump a species out there. Well, I should believe also the government of Liberia should have seen this coming, in a way, and uh, they should have taken measures well in advance to make sure that these people, they have, they have uh, an obligation after they leave uh, Liberia. However, even these Western organizations, they, they should have uh, uh, have a way of giving back not only to the private also to the, to the society by making sure that uh, these habitats are well actually taken care of. I'd like to ask your opinion also Peter what the future might be for, for biomedical testing at least in terms of using primates. For so long we were told they would be the answer for a number of different emerging infectious diseases and even if something like HIV and AIDS is now under control to some degree or understood to be, be treatable in certain ways or managed in certain ways, there's always new diseases coming forward. Zika is something no one talked about two years ago and we've just gone through devastating Ebola outbreaks in West Africa. Do you think there's always going to be a need uh, for testing on primates or are we going to reach a point where biomedical testing goes some other direction? Well, uh, primates are the best uh, models when it comes to uh, study of, of um, human disease because of uh, our closer 
genetic makeups to these uh, animals. However, uh, use of primates, and I'll go back to the wild caught uh, primates, it's, it's not the best way to go around it. I should think if we have a better way of doing it and not using primates, we should go that direction. Well, we, we might not be there yet in Africa because it involves a lot of investment and that's why most of the uh, uh, African scientists are still using primates for bio biomedical reasons. But I believe in one day we should get out of this idea of using primates and uh, inoculating them with all these diseases. Certainly, as I mentioned earlier, the, the, the general trend in, in the North America and Europe is away from primate testing of any sort, uh, especially on great apes. In the United States, particularly, the closure of so many of the biomedical testing facilities has created a sanctuary industry that is incredibly expensive and incredibly difficult to manage, but is an endeavor that has brought out tremendous commitment from so many organizations and some of the sanctuaries such as Save the Chimps or Chimp Haven, uh, the Center for Great Apes do fantastic work in dealing with these retired uh, biomedical and, and uh, space exploration chimpanzees and other, other species. I'm curious, back to Monrovia again, for, if I could, with Jim and Jenny Desmond in, in uh, Liberia. How long until this particular issue is put to rest? And the reason I ask is you're talking about some chimpanzees that may be living another 30 or 40 years, perhaps, on these islands. What is the long-term perspective there? Well, I think that's where we begin the conversations, and we already have begun conversations with local uh, authorities here, the Forest Development Authority, um, and other uh, local NGOs, and that's where the need comes in to develop a proper sanctuary, not only for these chimpanzees, the former research chimpanzees, um, who, as you say, uh, with the births that we've had, you're looking at another 50, 60 years just for those chimpanzees alone, uh, but we know, um, as you mentioned, there are other chimpanzees in Liberia um, being held captive. There is an illegal bushmeat and pet trade that's rampant in Monrovia. Um, in fact, we've already been working with authorities who have uh, legally confiscated chimpanzees and put them under our care graciously uh, for until we are able to develop a proper sanctuary, we're caring for those chimpanzees. And that's only in the six months that we've been here. So we know there are more chimps out there. We know there are more to come. And um, long term, I think one of the, the greatest benefits of starting a sanctuary, aside from the obvious uh, taking care of the welfare of the chimps who are brought into our care, is working with authorities to um, support law enforcement. There is a law here against hunting and killing uh, chimpanzees and other endangered wildlife. And uh, Sanctuary is not just a welfare institution. Uh, it's, we also would be supporting conservation efforts, protection efforts, law enforcement. Uh, we give a place for confiscated animals to come and, and have a safe haven and work in the education and community development aspects as well. So I think opening a sanctuary here and establishing that with partnering with local um, NGOs and, and government authorities is is a way of the future for this for this project. And we're, we're very enthusiastic about it. We've, it. It's been very well received by by the people here. So, and it's clearly in a need. It's been, I think, well established over time in the last 15 or 20 years that a sanctuary in a country sort of closes that chain of law enforcement and law enforcement definitely goes up. It's very hard to enforce a law if you have nowhere to put a uh, confiscated animal or a seized animal and certainly that is a, a crying need in, in Monrovia, in Liberia. But the, the real question in all this is you have great plans, what's it going to cost? And not just to build a facility but of course to keep running a facility. Are there numbers out there that you can attach to these, uh, these high ideals? Uh, yes, we're looking at the development of, you know, the initial development of infrastructure and being able to have a proper sanctuary, not only for the research chimps, but also new chimpanzees coming in. We're looking at over $1 million um, just to start. Uh, operating costs of $200,000 a year um, or more, a bit more. Um, and then to develop, uh, further develop infrastructure on the on all six islands, or if we, you know, pare them down to a few islands, we're looking at another 
one and a half million. So um, that's that's starting costs, you know. And then, of course, as you say, we have ongoing costs, and we'd love to establish an endowment fund for the chip. So we are going to be out uh, looking for large donors and grants and and securing um, support, long-term support in these efforts. Worth pointing out too that if you were to suddenly open a sanctuary and have 80 chimpanzees in it, you wouldn't by any means be the largest sanctuary currently operating in Africa. No, there are no. over 100, some have 150 or more, so you're actually yeah. just a mid-sized sanctuary at that point. Yes. Um, let me just also get, make sure I'm clear about one thing. Are tourist boats still going out to the islands regularly to visit the chimpanzees? Sorry. Are tourist boats still going out to visit the chimpanzees on a regular basis? Uh, no, we, we're just starting that back up again. We, uh, prior to us, our, our arrival here, people were being taken out on the feeding boat, which we didn't feel very comfortable about. Um, it was disruptive to the caregivers and the chimps, and also, of course, the safety issue um, and health issue. But we have uh, secured a second boat, which was not easy. Uh, but thanks to all the generous supporters, Oh, no. Oh, it's okay. We, we got, well, we can move on if we get Jimmy and Jenny back. A connection to Monrovia from anywhere has got to be so We've been able to do the, produce the chimps to people locally. I encourage tourism here and also, um, of course, bring in financial support with don donations. That's great. And it's also it's always worth pointing out, too, that uh, a sanctuary does not mean you shouldn't have a revenue stream. A revenue stream is often the most important part of a sanctuary, as is the educational possibilities. Yes. Um, Kathleen, let me let me ask you now. You from the dark days of a year ago when this looked like it was about to be a catastrophe to the stability you have now, where you have people on the ground and some some funds you can begin to fall back on. How's this story going to end? Because you probably can't keep going like this forever, at least not personally. And I assume this has to take on a life of its own, where it can be um, something of an ongoing concern. Will it have a happy ending? Doug, did you see the bags under my eyes? Is that why you're saying I can't? <laughs> uh, no, uh, absolutely. There, we do have a long-term plan. It feels like it might be taking us a while to get there, but a lot has certainly happened. When I look back to a year ago, we had no working water systems. No, I was working in a black box, basically. So we're forming partnerships. This has to be an independent entity with many partners, which is, I think, the direction we're moving in, and hope that's what we'll achieve. But I do want to go back, you know, it's really interesting when you think about the United States. So, you know, why, me personally, why am I involved in this? It, you know, we have a long-standing campaign in the United States to end the use of chimpanzees and in invasive research and retire them to sanctuary. You know, retiring them to sanctuary is just as hard, if not more difficult, than getting them to end chimpanzee research in the United States. But we're dedicated to making that happen. Of course, it takes funds, but it's the right thing to do. And here in the U.S., back in the mid-90s, there was a report by a scientific body known as the National Academies, and they said it's unethical to euthanize chimpanzees once you're done using them in research. So that set off a whole bunch of um, response, creating a sanctuary system in the United States. The government pays. It's a public-private partnership, but the government helps to pay for the care of chimpanzees in sanctuaries. That is not the case with any other animal using in facilities or biomedical research and it really has sparked a lot of discussion about the ethics of using primates and other animals and I think it's helping get us towards the day when we're not going to be using animals in harmful research in the United States. Of course that's very far off but um, it's been an important um, turning point in that in the issue. In terms of the cost of this though going forward if someone were to donate to this effort is there a case to be made for why the funds are important to go to these chimpanzees in Liberia and not to a traditional uh, wild conservation project? Of course, you know, everybody can choose what they think is the most important, um, you know, way to spend their donation, but I think the sanctuary will play an important part in conservation. So it's not you're choosing, you know, captive animals versus wild. I think we have an obligation to the captive individuals, um, and we're going to, you know, follow that obligation, but we want to be a part of the conservation efforts as well. And, you know, at the Humane Society of the United States, we want to get to the root cause of the issue. We don't want to have a need for sanctuaries in the U.S. or otherwise. 
um, not just for primates, but for any animal. So let's get to the root cause of the problem and end this um, long-term um, support that's needed for sanctuaries. And if someone watching this webcast wanted to contribute to the work that's ongoing right now in Liberia, is there a place or a site they can go to to donate? Yes, so if they go to GoFundMe, dot com slash abandoned chimps or just look up abandoned chimps um, on GoFundMe. We also have um, a fund on the Humane Society org website, but it's probably easier to find the GoFundMe site than for me to give you the long <laughs> URL for um, donations. But you know, I am so supportive, so appreciative of everyone who's been supporting us. Every single person, you know, there are people giving three dollars and it really does make a difference and they're a part you know I consider them my family now all these people who have donated to these animals and watching them and they're helping us name some of the infants so I think uh, they're they're very engaged and hopefully people will enjoy being a part of it thank you that seems like a good place to end this on a happy note an optimistic note and a hopeful note and uh, I'd like to thank all of our guests today Jim and Jenny Desmond in Monrovia Liberia um, Kathleen Conley at the uh, Humane Society offices in Washington, D.C., and Peter Fundy at the Institute of Primate Research here in Nairobi, Kenya. Thank you for joining us to discuss this issue, which one year ago, when the New York Blood Center ceased its support of the chimpanzees, the 66 chimpanzees on those islands, seemed like a very dark day. But I think through the work of the people that we talked to today and so many others out there, this may have a happy ending after all. Uh, thank you very much for joining us on the GRASS webcast, The Experts Speak. And we look forward to talking to you again next month on another key topic. Thank you very much.